Episode 76 Watching Star Trek 1970s cartoon To the hum of the fan The bowl of ice in front of it visibly melting Mmm, July Greetings and welcome in to the Patuxet General I am your host, Jess This week we have so much going on I'm going to get right to it We have a walk through Patuxet Park a potent and 300-year-old cocktail, the Rattle Skull, and an even more ancient recipe for flummery. Two versions, one Yankee and one Scottish. Then, the Shunned House by H.P. Lovecraft, in our House in the Corner series. But first, I must thank our Patreon subscribers. These blossoming folk are the strawberries, rhubarb, mint, tomatoes, summer squash, onions, zucchini, broccoli, dill, basil, rosemary, kale, beets, and rainbow beans that is the victory garden that we call the Patuxet General, without whom we would merely be weeds. So thank you. If you would like to become one of these sustaining folks, look for our page on patreon.com or simply follow the links in the show notes. So thank you. But until then, a very old dessert. This week's recipe is a colonial pudding called flummery. This Patuxa Village recipe can be found at gaspy.org and additional information can be found at culloddenbattlefield.wordpress.com. This recipe is set in ceramic, as it were. The tale of flummery dates back to the 17th century. Culloden Battlefield has this to say. First, a description. Flummery is a sweet dessert pudding that was popular in the UK from the 17th to 19th century. We first found the word upon seeing an interesting dish for Bonnie Prince Charlie Flummery and naturally had to discover more. According to one legend, Flora MacDonald was halfway through a dish of flummery when she was arrested for her part in helping Prince Charles escape following his defeat at Culloden. Another says that she made the dish for Prince Charles before he escaped, but who knows which, if either, is true. Even so, it was enough for us to find out what on earth flummery is. There appears to be variations on flummery from as early as the Middle Ages, where it was more of a broth that could be made by pretty much anyone. Oats were staple food of many, and thus even the poor could make their own flummery. Most recipes seem to follow along the lines of soaking cereal. Oats appear to be the most popular, the liquid from which is then set to form a clear jelly. Thankfully, this then seems to have been flavored with orange or rose water and topped with honey. Whilst we are calling the dish flummery in England, it is said to have been called wash brew, no doubt because of the resulting gray liquid resembled dishwater. Regardless of its appearance, the dish was considered healthy and was served to many invalids believing that its bland but hearty nature would strengthen those who were unwell. This practice of eating flummery when sick looks to have continued until the 20th century, though variations in the dish were becoming more common. As time went on, the jelly-like texture was achieved with gelatin, and the basic dish was enhanced with cream, eggs, fruit, and even wine. If you want to give it a go, here's one of the best recipes we can find from the Cook and the Housekeeper's Complete and Universal Dictionary from 1822. Steep in cold water for a day and a night, three large handfuls of very fine white oatmeal. Pour it off clear, add as much more water, and let it stand the same time. Strain it through a fine hair sieve and boil it till it is thick as hasty pudding, stirring it well all the time. When first strained, put to it one large spoonful of white sugar and two of orange flower water. Pour into shallow dishes and serve up with wine, cider, and milk. Or it will be very good with cream and sugar. Before I give you our local version, this one from gaspy.org, let's chat about one of the ingredients, sea moss. 
Modern-day users hail its many benefits, it being high in vitamins and minerals. However, not only should you be careful about excessive use due to heavy metal exposure, but also this seaweed can carry botulism. Sea moss is also the seaweed from which carrageenan is derived. Safely sourced and carefully processed, sea moss works like gelatin, useful for vegans and chock full of nutrients. So here is Gatsby.com's Flummery. This is actually a blancmange pudding with a sea moss base. Sea moss has always been valued for its curative and vitamin powers. Earlier variation was called pap when using oatmeal in place of sea moss, but not as palatable. For this you will need 1 quart milk, 3 tablespoons sugar, 1 tablespoon sea moss farina, 1 teaspoon vanilla, and a half a teaspoon of salt. Put milk in a double boiler and sprinkle sea moss into it, stirring well all the time. Heat slowly and stir often. When it boils up and looks white, add the sugar, salt, and flavoring. Strain and turn into a mold which has been dipped in cold water. It takes three hours to harden. Serve topped with cream and sugar or fresh fruit. And enjoy! This week's drink comes from the Forgotten Drinks of Colonial New England by Corinne Hirsch. I suggest you check it out on your own, but today we'll chat about the Rattle Skull. The drink is hundreds of years old and the name stems from the expression, meaning, somebody who talks a lot. After taking a gander at the recipe, I submit anyone who drank this would talk a lot. But this is what BonAppetit.com has to say about the Rattle Skull. I am really into this drink. People think it doesn't sound good, but these same people, upon tasting it, are totally blown away by how damn delicious it is. For me, this drink brings together all the good feelings from those autumnal field trips to Plymouth Plantation, but with the fun of it being, you know, a drink. To make it, Combine one ounce brandy or rum, three quarters of an ounce lime juice, one half ounce ginger honey syrup, and a pinch of salt into a glass. Give it a quick stir and top with porter. Garnish with fresh nutmeg and a lime wedge. Time to get the sweaters and the tricorn hats out of storage. Oh, and some tankards. After all, you're running your own tavern now. You should probably invest in some good tankards. And with that rattle skull, you could possibly take a walk through the Patuxet Park. The Patuxet Park Garden Society is responsible for educational and entertaining identifying signs on the trees in Patuxet Park. This year's 4th of July brought variable weather to Patuxet Village, and by that I mean violent electrical storms, dropping inches of water, then sun hot enough to instantly dry the streets. During one of those dry spells, I took to a neighborhood walk. The scents from Tuxet Park drew me in. I could not help but amble my way around the path, near the mouth that opens up towards the Asbury Boathouse and the parking lot for the park. There is a sign by the Warwick Wildlife and Conservation Commission, which gives information on trees and asks how many different species you can find. And on little signs on each, a description of that tree. I only found nine, but I admit I got distracted when I found that tree in my backyard. Its actual name, the Morris Alba, or White Mulberry. The sign does tell me that the wood is also used for fence posts. Hmm, what a good idea. But yes, there are great examples of local trees, like white ash, silver sycamore and sugar maple, not to mention Norway spruce. It is a fabulous, cool, lovely stroll. Come check out Patuxet Park at 2 Eastview Street, Warwick, Rhode Island, 02888, 
and soak up a little summer fun in the village. Enjoy. I want to tell you about my friend Mike and his Electromagnetic Pinball Museum and Restoration Arcade. It's an all-inclusive place to relax and share anything related to modern pinball, EM pinball, and arcade games. A group of pinball and arcade fans with an addiction to games of all kinds and Lego too. $10 gets you free play on pinball and arcade games all day. You can find them at 881 Main Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or online at www.electromagneticpinballmuseum.com. And now on our House on the Corner series, the continued reading and final chapter of The Shunned House by H.P. Lovecraft. Chapter 5 I had been lying with my face away from my uncle's chair, so that in this sudden flash of awakening I saw only the door to the street, the more northerly window, and the wall and floor and ceiling toward the north of the room all photographed with morbid vividness on my brain, in a light brighter than the glow of the fungi or the rays from the street outside. It was not a strong or even fairly strong light, certainly not strong enough to read an average book by, but it cast a shadow of myself and the cot on the floor and had a yellowish penetrating force that hinted at things more potent than luminosity. This I perceived with unhealthy sharpness, despite the fact that two of my other senses were violently assailed. For on my ears rang the reverberations of the shocking scream, while my nostrils revolted at the stench which filled the place. My mind, as alert as my senses, recognized the gravely unusual, and almost automatically I leaped up and turned about to grasp the destructive instruments which we had left trained on the moldy spot before the fireplace. As I turned, I dreaded what I was about to see, for the scream had been my uncle's voice, and I knew not against what menace I should have to defend him and myself. There were horrors beyond horrors, and this was one of those nuclei of all dreamable hideousness which the cosmos saves to blast an accursed and unhappy few. Out of the fungus-ridden earth steamed up a vaporous corpse light, yellow and diseased, which bubbled and lapped to a gigantic height in vague outlines half-human and half-monstrous, through which I could see the chimney and fireplace beyond. It was all eyes, wolfish and mocking and the ghost's insect-like head dissolved at the top into a thin stream of mist which curled putridly about and finally vanished up the chimney. I say that I saw this thing, but it was only in conscious retrospection that I ever definitely traced its damnable approach to form. At the time, it was to me only a seething, dimly phosphorescent cloud of fungus loathsomeness, enveloping and dissolving into an abhorrent plasticity, the one object to which all my attention was focused. That object was my uncle, the venerable Elihu Whipple, who was blackening and decaying features leered and gibbered at me, and reached out dripping claws to rend me in a fury which this horror had brought. It was the sense of routine which kept me from going mad. I had drilled myself in preparation for this crucial moment, and blind training saved me. Recognizing the bubbling evil as no substance reachable by matter or material chemistry, and therefore ignoring the flamethrower which loomed on my left, I threw on the current of the crook's tube apparatus and focused towards the scene of the immortal blasphemous, the strongest ether radiations which man's art can arouse from the spaces and fluids of nature. There was a bluish haze and frenzied sputtering, and the yellowish phosphorescence grew dimmer to my eyes. But I saw the dimness was only that of contrast, and that the waves of the machine had no effect whatsoever. Then. In the midst of that demonic spectacle, I saw a fresh horror, which brought cries to my lips and sent me fumbling and staggering toward that unlocked door to the quiet street. 
careless of what abnormal terrors I loosed upon the world, or what thoughts or judgment of men I brought down upon my head. In that dim blend of blue and yellow, the form of my uncle had commenced a nauseous liquefaction whose essence eludes all description, and in which there played across his vanishing face such changes of identity as only madness can conceive. He was at once a devil and a multitude, a charnel house and a pageant. Lit by the mixed and uncertain beams, the gelatinous face assumed a dozen, a score, a hundred aspects, grinning as it sank to the ground on a body that melted like tallow, in the caricatured likeness of legions, strange, and yet not so strange. I saw the features of the Harris line, masculine and feminine, adult and infantile, the other features old and young, coarse and refined, familiar and unfamiliar. For a second, there flashed a degraded counterfeit of a miniature of poor mad Roby Harris that I had seen at the School of Design Museum, and another time I thought I caught the raw-boned image of Mercy Dexter, as I recalled her from a painting in Carrington Harris's house. It was frightful beyond conception, toward the last, when a curious blend of servant and baby visages flickered close to the fungus floor, where a pool of greenish grease was spreading. It seemed as though the shifting features fought against themselves and strove to form contours like those of my uncle's kindly face, and that he tried to bid me farewell. It seemed to me that I hiccoughed a farewell with my own parched throat as I lurched out into the street a thin stream of grease following me as I went through the door to the rain-drenched sidewalk. The rest is shadowy and monstrous. There was no one in the soaking street, and in all the world there was no one I dared tell. I walked aimlessly south, past College Hill and the Athenaeum, down Hopkins Street, and over the bridge to the business section where tall buildings seemed to guard me as material modern things guard the world from ancient and unwholesome wonder. Then gray dawn unfolded wetly from the east, silhouetting the archaic hill and its venerable steeples, and beckoning me to a place where my terrible work was still unfinished. And in the end, I went, wet, hatless, and dazed in the morning light, and entered that awful door in Benefit Street which I had left ajar, and which still swung cryptically in full sight of the early housegoers to whom I dared not speak. The grease was gone, for the moldy floor was porous, and in front of the fireplace there was no vestige of the giant doubled-up form in the night. I looked at the cot, the chairs, the instruments, my neglected hat, and the yellowed straw hat of my uncle. Dazedness was uppermost, and I could scarcely recall what was dream and what was reality. The thought trickled back, and I knew that I had witnessed things more horrible than I had dreamed. Sitting down, I tried to conjecture, as nearly as sanity would let me, just what had happened, and how I might end the horror, if indeed it had been real. Matter it seemed not to be, nor ether, nor anything else conceivable by mortal mind. What, then, by some exotic emanation, some vampirish vapor such as Exeter rustics tell of lurking over certain churchyards. This I felt was the clue, and again I looked at the floor before the fireplace where the mold and nitre had taken strange forms. In ten minutes my mind was made up, and taking my hat I set out for home where I bathed, ate, and gave by telephone an order for a pickaxe, a spade, a military gas mask, and six carboys of sulfuric acid, all to be delivered the next morning at the cellar door of the shunned house in Benefit Street. And after that, I tried to sleep, and failing, passed the hours in reading and in the composition of inane verses to counteract my mood. By 11 a.m. the next day, I had commenced digging. It was sunny weather, and I was glad of it. I was still alone, for as much as I feared the unknown horror I sought, there was more fear in the thought of telling anybody. Later, 
I told Harris only through sheer necessity, and because he had heard odd tales from the old people, which disposed him ever so little toward belief. As I turned up the stinking black earth in front of the fireplace, my spade causing a viscous yellow ichor to ooze from the white fungi which it severed, I trembled at the dubious thoughts of what I might uncover. Some secrets of the inner earth are not good for mankind, and this seemed to me to be one of them. My hand shook perceptibly, but still I delved, after a while standing in a large hole that I made. With the deepening of the hole, which was about six feet square, the evil smell increased, and I lost all doubt of my imminent contact with the hellish thing whose emanations had cursed the house for almost a century and a half. I wondered what it would look like, what its form and substance would be, and how big it might have waxed through the long ages of life-sucking. At length, I climbed out of the hole and dispersed the heaped-up dirt, then arranging the great carboys of acid around the near two sides, so that, when necessary, I might empty them down the aperture in quick succession. After that, I dumped earth only along the other two sides, working more slowly and donning my gas mask as the smell grew. I was nearly unnerved at my proximity to the nameless thing at the bottom of the pit. Suddenly, my spade struck something softer than earth. I shuddered and made a motion as if to climb out of the hole, which was now as deep as my neck. Then courage returned, and I scraped away more dirt in the light of the electric torch I had provided. The surface I uncovered was fishy and glassy, a kind of semi-putrid congealed jelly with suggestions of translucency. I scraped further and saw that it had form. There was a rift where a part of the substance was folded over. The exposed area was huge and roughly cylindrical, like a mammoth, soft, blue-white stovepipe doubled in two, its largest part some two feet in diameter. Still more I scraped, and then abruptly... I leaped out of the hole and away from the filthy thing, frantically unstopping and tilting the heavy carboys and precipitating their corrosive contents one after another down the charnel gulf and upon the unthinkable abnormality whose titan elbow I had seen. The blinding maelstrom of greenish-yellow vapor which surged tempestuously up from the hole as the floods of acid descended will never leave my memory. All along the hill, people tell of the yellow day when virulent and horrible fumes arose from the factory waste dumped in the Providence River. But I know how mistaken they are as to the source. They tell, too, of the hideous roar which came at the same time from the disordered water pipe or gas main underground. But again, I would correct them if I dared. It was unspeakably shocking, and I do not know how I lived through it. I did faint after emptying the fourth carboy, which I had to handle after the fumes had begun to penetrate my mask, and when I recovered, I saw that the hole was emitting no fresh vapors. The two remaining carboys I emptied down without particular result, and after a time I felt it safe to shovel the earth back into the pit. It was twilight before I was done, but fear was gone out of the place. The dampness was less fetid, and all the strange fungi had withered to a kind of harmless grayish powder, which blew ash-like along the floor. One of the earth's nethermost terrors had perished forever, and if there be a hell, it had received, at last, the demon soul of an unhallowed thing. And as I patted down the last spadeful of mold, I shed the first of many tears with which I have paid unaffected tribute to my beloved uncle's memory. The next spring, no more pale grass and strange weeds came up in the shunned house's terraced garden, and shortly afterward, Carrington Harris rented the place. It is still spectral, but its strangeness fascinates me, and I shall find mixed with my relief a queer regret when it is torn down to make way for a tawdry shop or vulgar apartment building. The barren old trees in the yard have begun to bear small, sweet apples. And last year, the birds nested in their gnarled boughs.
Thank you once again for joining us today at the Patuxent General. If you would like to reach out with a recipe or a local ghost story, our email is jess at patuxentgeneral.com. Please reach out, especially if you have a question about our pop-up general store. But until then, I'll meet you right back here next time at the Patuxent General. Something for Posterity Production, pre-recorded in Patuxent.